the problem is that the devil has tricked us out of everything that has power in the church so we no longer think there's power in our worship that there's power in our praise that when we lift up a voice of triumph that there are unseen powers in the spirit realm that are being shaken they are not worried that you came to church on Sunday morning but they are worried that you are going to come out of your casual comfort Christianity and begin to praise God like he's worthy of there will not be a praise that the Lord is not worthy of there will not be too radical of a person that on the day of judgment that the Lord says you are just too passionate for my kingdom you are just too passionate for my people you are just too passionate in your worship but there will be a people on judgment day that the Lord looks at in the eyes and the Bible says they call them Lord Lord and he says that you were lukewarm you did not want to praise when the word told you to praise you didn't want to pray for the sick when the Bible told you to pray for the sick. You did not want to preach the gospel. The Lord has his preferences in the word of God. But the problem is is that we continue to exalt our preferences above the Lord's preferences in the church. So when we hear the worship song, we automatically go to, I like this, I don't like that. But the problem is the song is not for us. The song is for him. So when we lift up a praise. It's not for a preacher, but the praise is for the king of glory. When we hear that, when we get a good message, we no longer say, was that a good message for me? But was that what the Lord wanted to be preached? Was repentance preached like it was in the Bible? This is normal. Many of you would say, Colton, you're just too radical. This is just too loud. And I want to ask you, was it too loud in the throne room when the seraphim were shaking the doorposts of the building yet I lift up I just preach a little too loud and all of a sudden you're too loud I just don't like it when you shout like that do you need to breathe like you need to be like that Colton you're just too radical but I might be radical to a people that check in and clock in and clock out of church but I am normal in the book of Acts I am normal in the Bible I am normal in the book of Acts. deliverance will become normal in the church laying hands on the sick that will become a radical praise will become normal in the church and what you don't realize is God's going to do it whether you like it or not that God will find a remnant come on where's the Holy Ghost warriors in a generation who's the one that's going to go to war you might not have something to praise about come on you got a family going to hell and you're still not praising you're still not worshiping you're still not lifting up a praise for them you got nothing to shout about you still God's done nothing in your life we got to ask ourselves if we took the Holy Spirit out of our lives when was the last time there were supernatural occurrences in our life that we actually needed the Holy Spirit for and that we couldn't do in our own natural cardinal ways so many times we go through and we go through and years go by and I wonder when was the last time God used me to preach to the poor when was the last time God used me to heal the sick When's the last time God used me in a supernatural way that all in wonder struck my life? And I wondered, why have I been living the way I have been living? But I'm here to blow the trumpet as a mouthpiece for God and tell a people that you don't got to wait another five years to wake up, that there is an altar with fire. And I don't care if you've been in the church 20 years, 30 years. Come on, some of you, you're saying it's too late in my life to burst something. And you got to ask yourself, am I like Sarah? Am I really going to mock God? Is it really too late? Oh, I'm seven years old. Is it really too late for God to burst something in your life? Or are you just in rebellion? Are you just in disobedience? Have you went through the motions so long that you're now refusing God's supernatural power and saying, I enjoy the Holy Spirit, yet I don't want the fire? So let me just hit you with a little revelation right here. The Holy Ghost comes into our life. It's dudamous power for all you who went through your schooling. And it's called dudamous power. And what happened, that's the word we get, dynamite. So what we can have in the inside of us is we can have the Holy Ghost dynamite on the inside of us. But John the Baptist blew the trumpet. And he said there's one that's coming to not just baptize in the Holy Spirit, guys. But he is coming with a fire that's going to light off the dynamite. And there will 
will be divine. Ex- there will be evidence that the Holy Ghost is exploding out of your life. Why are you not mad at the devil? Why are you not aggressive at the devil? Some of you, you were so violent, you were ready to beat up everyone at the bar, and then you allowed religion to neuter you in the church. And I'm wondering, when are we going to get some people that were vi- just as violent in the kingdom as they were in the world? When you were in the gang, did we bring them in and they no longer cater to this religious system, but they say, Lord, I'm going to do what I used to do, except I used to do it for the devil. That's what I said in my life. I used to work full time for the devil. Why am I going to allow, now that I'm in the kingdom of God, why am I going to play part time Christianity? Come on, why am I going to do that when God died so I could live the Bible, so that I could live a supernatural life? So what we, come on, what, what are we doing? Checking in and checking out. I want to challenge some of you. If you're not checking off the checklist of what Jesus said it, it, you actually need to do for you to call yourself a believer, calling ourselves a Christian does not matter to the devil. He doesn't care what you label yourself. He cares what the world is labeling you. So what you got to ask yourself, when I go out into the world, do those people in the world actually label me as a Christian or do they label me as I'm in the world? Do when I go around a people, am I blowing the trumpet? Am I sounding? Am I trying to pray for them? Am I being aggressive in the spirit? Am I binding the demonic forces that are holding that person back? Or am I just going through the motions on a day-to-day life? Come on, the message that the spirit is saying to the church, come on, it's like revelation. And he's saying, break out of the four walls before it's too late. That there is a generation on their way to hell. And the the lie of the devil is to say they don't want to hear it. Yet I wonder how many people have you preached to and they told you that I don't want to hear it. Because when we were out in the streets, it seemed like you could just love them a little bit and and they would crack right away. And I don't know, just about every single person was somewhat inviting, not to religion, but to the real Jesus. Oh wait, you got back pain? Yes, pray for me. Yes, I got arthritis. Pray for me. Yes, I'm in a wheelchair. Pray for me. And these people are desperate in the world. And all we want to do is spoon feed them more religion and put them to sleep. And the the spirit is blowing the trumpet saying, when are we going to give them the Christianity of the Bible? When is the book of Acts going to begin to play out like it did? The same Holy Spirit that was on the inside of Jesus, that was on the inside of Paul, that was on the inside of Peter, is up on the inside of you. And he, he is not... He's not showing partiality to you. He actually told you to go do it. So when he said, lift up a voice of triumph unto God, this was what he was saying. It's not optional if you want to be a Christian. It's not optional whether you want to shout unto God. It's not optional whether you want to raise holy hands. It's not optional whether you want to do that or do this. Either I'm going to believe the whole thing and I'm going to live it out in my life. Come on, the religious Pharisees, they were not mad at Jesus for coming into the synagogue. And keep in mind, they were showing up to every one of Jesus' service. If they really didn't like him that much, some of you, you really don't like me shouting like this, giving you the word. And some of you, you show up to the meeting, yet you don't get mad until we actually do the things Jesus did. So you'll hang out, the altar call me, and you'll leave as soon as you see demons driven out, as soon as you see the sick being healed, as soon as you're seeing the power of God move. Why? Because you're exactly like them. You want to be on the outskirts of the revival? You want to see what's going on? The Bible said that even Herod, even Herod who wanted to kill him, wanted to see the supernatural power of God. But I'm not interested, guys, in being another multitude. What does that mean? That means that thousands after thousands of people would sit there and listen to Jesus preach and see the signs and wonders. Yet the Bible says that only 120 people showed up on the day of Pentecost. Why? We know that there was the 12. They were for sure there. We know that there was the women. Okay, that gives us about 20. And we know that there was the 72 only leaving about another 20. Who were they? Other people. John said that there's other 
church driving out demons over here. So there was a group of them that came in, and that was about the 120. Who were the ones that were obedient to the message of Christ? Who were those? The ones that were doing the works, not watching the works, not showing up church service to church service, not doing anything for God. And you're the first one to step back and say, I just really didn't like what Pastor Young said about that. I really didn't like this song. Oh, if we could just play this song, if we could just do it like that. I really didn't like the length of the service, but I'm not here for preference. I'm here for the presence of God. I'm here for the Holy Ghost. One day in the house of the Lord. It's better, come on, crank that thing up. Uh, one day in the house of the Lord. It's better than a thousand days in the house of the wicked. You ought to have seen me when the devil had me bound. You ought to see how bound up I am. And you, you, you should have seen. Jesus rode in on a war horse. Guys, he didn't ride in like a hippie into my life. Jesus rode, come on, Jesus rode in on a war horse. And he says, if you're willing, what is the problem with the church? They're not willing. If you're willing, I will do these things. If you want to partner with me, I will do these things in your life. But now we no longer want to partner with Jesus. We sit back in the back and we say, God, if you want to deliver me, I'll be at the, I'll be watching Netflix for three hours tomorrow. And the Lord's saying, why would I deliver you? Why would I reward that? Why would I reward you catering and living like the culture? Drunk on the wine of the American culture. Like First Peter says, he says that what happens is now that these signs have come, now that the signs of the end of the end, now that the famines, the earthquake, the pestilence, everything in World War III is about to break out, now that we see the signs of the times, what do we do? Be sober? What does that mean? Don't be casual in the presence of God. Don't be drunk. Not Know the signs and the times. One thing that happens when we get drunk, many of you know this because you came out of that life, is you begin to forget the time. Time washes away. Ray, you might know this. You get to the bar, it's like 9.30. You have a couple drinks. Next thing you know, you're riding home in the car. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're missing your day of work tomorrow. And what are we doing? We're drinking the wine of American culture. We don't really know if God's blowing the trumpet. We don't really know if it's time for revival. We don't really know what God's doing. Yet we go through all the activities, and the Lord's saying, why are you drunk? Why aren't you drunk on the Holy Holy Ghost. And this is what else he says. He says, be serious. Be serious. Be serious. Be watchful. How many of you had your eyes open before I got up? Many of you, you do now because somebody's doing this. But before I did, were your eyes open or were you thinking about getting a raise at your job? Were you thinking about getting a promotion or that guy or that girl or this or that or the new car or the new house? All the things that Luke chapter 14 says that squanders revival, that cares the riches of life, all the pleasures that the world has to offer. It's not drugs and alcohol. Many of you can testify that drugs and al alcohol did not stop you from coming to the revival. But what do I have? People with excuses. Excuses, guys, is the number one thing that will stop you from getting the fire today. Excuses are going to be the number one thing so that you miss out on your Red Sea moment and you never get all of what. Am I saying you're going to go to hell? No, you're not going to go to hell. But some of you, you may be. But I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm saying, I don't want to. I don't want to just speak before as Paul said but many of you you will continue to live your life on the chain of grace going all, as close as you can to sin but not sinning allowing but what you got to realize you'll never accomplish all that God has for you living the life that you're living you'll never get there you'll never get there unless you start to sacrifice unless you start to surrender unless you start to live a holy life what did he say he said love and and holiness. He said faith, number one thing, we got to have faith. He said then love, number, go, come on, we all know how important love is, but when's the last time we talked about faith, love, and holiness? Holiness is like a swear word in the church. You probably thought I was going to preach more about driving out demons, but I can tell you if you tried to live the holy life I'm living, you would never even know. Could you look at me and you say, oh, he's probably just living like I'm living, but that's the problem, is that we begin to judge each other by 
by each other instead of judging ourselves according to the life that Jesus lived. And when we begin to judge ourselves and look in the mirror, that is the word of God. Paul says you look in the mirror, which is the word of God. Today, I'm the mirror to you. I'm going to preach the word. I'm going to show you your faults. But what's going to happen is, Paul said, is you're going to look in the mirror and quickly you'll dash off and you'll forget what you've seen in the mirror. I can't reach out and clean the smudge and wash that out of your life. But the Holy Spirit can. That's why we have altar calls in this church. That's why there's rivers of living water flowing from this church. My wife is birthing something today. And that's a, it's all just been, it's all just been, let me preach to you. It's all just been a big prophetic picture of what God wants to do in this place. But what happened in my life, what happened in my life is I realized that all my plans had to go in the garbage. I was going to preach today. I had all my plans figured out. And what God did, the water broke at five in the morning. So what you got to do is you got to wake up. You got to realize all your plans are garbage. They don't matter. The Lord is not worried or doesn't care about those things that are worthless on the day of judgment. You know, I had to throw it all out and realize that it's only my trust in God. My faith is God. This is all that's going to carry me. The leading of the voice of God. We've gone so long in our lives without hearing the voice of God. Could we even be led by him if we wanted to? You know, I had to listen to the voice of God. God, what are you saying? He said, I'm gonna t- we're going to go to the hospital and your wife should probably not even going to listen to you so just go there and I'm going to fly flip the baby already so that's okay and I'm going to send you to blow the trumpet at River of Destiny. Why? Because there is something birthing in the spirit and unless you go there to preach something might not break. The water at River of Destiny might not break and unless that thing breaks the baby cannot come. I'm telling you unless the water breaks in your life that baby of revival that baby that God wants to birth out of you cannot come. So that's what happened. The the water broke. I threw my plans away and we had to get to the hospital and I was wondering to the Lord, I'm like, is there going to be a C-section or is it going to be a natural birth? And the Lord said, you think I would take you this far? See, if we want to schedule something, if we want to schedule the birthing process, then we need man to help us. But that's not what God wants to do. He wants it to be a natural, organic thing. He doesn't want us to have have another good conference praise God for those but many of us we wait around for another good conference why so that we could take a little bit more oil for ourselves and never go and do what God wants us to do and eventually we're going to suck and suck and suck the oil and never get any for our own life and the time will hit the time will tick 12 o'clock guys and five foolish virgins will be waiting and God will say I sat you in the chair for 20 25 years and you always waited for the man of God. You always waited for the new person, the new speaker, the conference. And you never actually went out and got your own oil. You never actually, you know what brings joy to my life? It's not coming to church. It's bringing the church to the people. It's seeing somebody get delivered of demons. You know what joy that brings? Jesus said the Bible says that when the 72, come on, is it okay if I talk about this? It says the 72 came back and it says Jesus rejoice in spirit. It's the only time in the whole Bible where it says that the Holy Spirit actually rejoiced when when the 72 came back and they said, Jesus, you're not going to believe this, that the demons are actually obeying us. They're actually listening to us. So some of you, you're going to get drafted, not into the army, but the SWAT team of God to, today. And Ray, you can testify on this. Sorry, I'm picking you. But when he, they drafted, did they draft you, right? They drafted Ray into the army. Did they give you, did they give you two years to study? Did they give you four years to study? Did they give Ray any time? No, they will draft you in. God will take you off the street and he will say, I'm out. Who's going to teach me, God? I'm going to teach you. I'm the Holy Spirit. I know all things. I search the deep mysteries of God and you, we, we have kicked the Holy Spirit out of our mind, and we've allowed for revelation, and we are addicted. We are a generation that's addicted to more revelation, to more good teaching. Praise God for those things, but when we're always catering, what have you done with the other five messages that Pastor Young preached to you? Church, 
church, church, and Pastor Young's feeding you amazing stuff, and we're getting all this good teaching, but when have we actually applied the good teaching in our life? So why does God want you to get more of that and less of him? What I le- realized was you need an equal amount of everything or else the seed will be choked out. So we have wet fields right now. If we were to plant seeds in all water, oh, what, what are we talking about? All water and no sun, no sun, then the seeds would be choked out. So we got to realize we need a good balance. We need to get out there. That's why I preach. And at the house, we're breaking out at the house, and there was about 60, 70 people. But when I said, hey, what we're going to do is I'm not going to preach a message to you and not empower you to do those things. I'm going to equip you. I'm not preaching. I'm actually equipping you. Where, where, where's the training ground? What good table? Are the chairs comfy? Oh, the chairs are really comfy out there in the in the labor, out there in the fields. Why are we continuing to work outside of the fields? If we did that as farmers, nothing would ever be planted. Nothing would ever be harvested. So what I did was I said, we got to get out in the field. I can talk to you all about it all day long, but we got to begin to get out of our comfort zone. Is is it what I want to do? No. It's about, you know, I've done it too many times, but that's what we got to do as the church. So I'd be a hypocrite to preach you a message, and I think I'm going to, I think this is what the Spirit is saying. I want to challenge you to begin to get out there by yourself. No, you don't have to go by yourself. If a seed dies, it will produce friends, not not more seed. It will produce friends. So what's my problem, Colton? How I don't have friends in my life? How come I don't have believers in fellowship? Have you really died? Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will not have friends. So what we did, we went out there and praised God. We actually got kicked out of a restaurant for driving out demons. Who would have known? Who would have known that? Who would have known, guys, that, that real, the biblical Christianity was so exciting? Why, why are we covering up all the exciting stuff in the church. Some of you, some of you, this is probably your first time, and what we'll do is we'll pray in tongues, and we'll kind of cover our mouth, and we'll kind of hide over here. Oh, and we'll drive out a demon over here. Oh, don't let him see. But we got to realize that those are the things that are actually exciting in God. So you can be in Christ and not be in Christ, not be in you. So what we got to do is we got to begin to now pull it out and show people. Jesus never once, you know in the Bible, Jesus said, hey, you got a demon, I'm going to pull you up here in front Oh, and the Pharisees over there, they're really mad at me right now. But you know what? It's the Sabbath. What am I going to do on the Sabbath? What am I going to labor on? What am I going to work on? I'm going to work on people. I'm going to cast out. I'm going to heal the sick. He would do that, and they would all get mad at him. See, they were not mad at him until he began to do the works, until he began to get. He said, we're not just going to preach about this thing. Some of them, they probably thought Jesus was like them, even though the Bible says he preached with authority unlike the religious people. Colton, why are you so, why are you just, because cause I, I don't, I can't help it. When the spirit of the Lord breaks in upon somebody, you no longer preach like you used to preach. You no longer act like you used to act. You need to make some allowance in your life for the grace of God. He spoke that to me. He said, my people are not, they're not even functioning in their mind. They're not allowing for any grace that I have for them to actively move in their life. Do you need the grace of God to scroll on TikTok for three hours a day? Do you need the grace of God to watch Netflix and watch the news? I don't even know what they're playing on TV. The squid games, whatever, all this demonic stuff. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the grace of God. What For what? So I can catch a word of knowledge. So that I can, I can work in supernatural healing. So that I can actually do what? The works of Jesus and greater. And greater. And this is what we do. Preach the message. We preach the Bible verses, but there's no belief in them. There's no activation in them. The Bible says that if you do not exercise, it's never going to grow. Your faith is never going to grow unless you actually do the things. Oh, Colton, I got fear in my life. You want to know how you defeat fear in your life? You ride up on a war horse and you say, fear, you're bowing down to me today. I am not surrendering to you. I am working with the Holy Ghost. There is supernatural power invested in my life and I'm not going to squander it. So this is what this is what he's going to want. On the day of judgment, he wants interest on what he's planted on the inside of you. 
He wants interest. Well, my, well you, you buried your talents. You don't even know what they are because you're not even worried about them. You've buried your head in the sand, and you've buried your talents right, behind, right beside you. And the Lord is on judgment day is going to say, oh, you had two. Let me see. Do you got four talents? What did you do with all the power I gave you? What did you do with all the good teaching, all the good? Re- oh, and the word of God that they're dying for in other countries, you left sitting on your shelf with a half inch of dust? What are you doing with your life? You're squandering the inheritance that I've put on the inside of you. So on the day of where what, what am I getting out of the deal? Because Christianity isn't about what God can do for us. It's about what we can do for God. Why? Because we're no longer living for this life. The Bible says that our minds, every our focus should be up in the third. We are seated in the third heaven. And what does that mean? We're looking down at the second heaven. And let me teach some of you because you have no idea what I'm talking about. The, the third heaven is heaven. The first heaven is the earth. The second heaven is is what you feel on the inside of you right now. Well, hold on, I just don't know. The demons are on the inside of you. They're angry. They're built up. You're like, I don't know why, but I'm shaking. I'm trembling. In the second heaven, there is a war being waged for your very souls. And the last place you want to be in a war is not aware of the war that you're in. And that's where many of us are at. We know we don't put on our armor when we wake up. We go out to battle. We go out to battle and we turn our back to the enemy. And the Lord says, where's the armor that I gave you? When are you exercising your armor? When is your faith being put up? When is the sword of the sword of the Lord being preached to your friends, to your family, to everyone around you who's going to hell? When are those shoes being the walk? When is the, when is the belt of truth gonna overcome the false love of the American church? I wonder when love and truth and deed will be preached instead of a compromising new age love that says you can do whatever you want to do and go to hell. I refuse to get up in my friends and family and just allow them to go to hell without hearing the real gospel where Paul said you ought to lay down your life. He said in the book of Romans, it builds it all up until what? He says, therefore, I want you to do what? Therefore, I want you to lay down your lives as living sacrifices. What does that mean? My hands, my mouth, my feet, everything that I have, this earthly body sack, I call it, that we are living in that's going to perish away. We ought to use that to glorify God. The Bible says if we don't glorify God, that the very rocks will cry out, that the very trees will cry out, that everything the earth, the Lord has put here. You know the mountains melt in the presence of God, yet some of you, you're going to be, people are going to get touched at the altar. I don't know why this happens, and some don't get touched. Why? because you're now casual in the presence of God when mountains are melting when I'm guys I was trembling this morning not because I was about to have a baby because the Lord was moving because the presence of God fell upon my family and he says I've called you to do more today than just have a baby I've called you to do more in life than just have a family and kids praise God for them and they're up there they're, you know how I am with my family but guys we got to realize that in the natural there are things happening but that doesn't mean that we can take our eyes off of what God's doing in the spirit what is he doing he's changing lives he's saving people he's bringing repentance and holiness back to his church guys he's delivering people he's healing people and we are going to take our eyes off of that for what you know how many excuses I hear from people you know how many excuses I say and and the Lord says you know I had something for them here How many meetings have you guys missed when God had something for you and your chair was empty and there was a flame of fire on your chair? How many meetings have you missed? And God was waiting for you like the person at a restaurant. And he's sitting there in the secret place. And he's saying, I wonder when Johnny's going to show up. I wonder when Rita. I wonder when Esther. I wonder when Jared's going to show up in this place. Why? Because I got a message burning in me. And if I don't get them the message, they're not going to be equipped for battle. They're not going to have everything they need to be a battering ram against the gates of hell. They're not going to have everything they need to be a wrecking ball against what the devil's got against their life so what happens is we then suffer we suffer in the flesh 
Then we get sickness on us. We get depressed. We get all these things. And we begin to blame God for our problems. And we say, God, why weren't you here? Why weren't you there? And we begin to accuse God and ask him, why wasn't he here or there? And he's wondering, where were you at all day when you were at your job? Where were you? Oh, and you never once, you know, cried out to me. You never once invited me in. You know that God gave us dominion over the earth. What does that mean? That he gave us dominion, and he says, I'm not going to invade your life unless you ask me. I'm not going to come. Why, is prayer, why do we have prayer? So we can invite God into a situation. So we can invite God in to break out. So we can invite God in to bring his supernatural power and say, God, I'm not working by my own strength. Why are you doing that? Church, you're still operating by your own strength. And there will come a time in these end days, cardinal Christianity is going to fall. And there will be a mass separation. Can I prophesy a little bit? There will be a mass separation in the church. And it's going to be the people they want to check in and check out and they're going to begin to slide off and backslide and all the church is going to wonder where they're going and we're all going to freak out and pray for everyone but what we got to realize is in these end times God's going to do some things that we don't understand so when God's birthing this baby God, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't know every plan. I don't know every purpose. But what we got to do is begin to trust the process. When the preacher gets up there and preaches a message, we no longer say that was a good message. We say that that was the very voice of God speaking to me. Some of you know this and you've already been hit. And the Lord has highlighted you with a certain phrase. He has highlighted you with a certain word. And you realize you got to repent. You realize you got to do something different. The problem, come on, we know that if we do the same thing over and over that we will get the same results even the world knows this yet we do it time and time again and we have our run sheet and we go through the motions and we have this plan and that plan and this and the Lord's saying when are you going to throw out the run sheet and when are you going to give the devil the runs when are you going to put the devil on the run in your life when are you going to chase him off from assaulting your family you realize you ought to lift up a prayer just to give the devil a migraine for putting your kids on drugs. You ought to lift up a praise. You ought to turn your prayer closet into a war closet. You ought to put some war paint. Have you ever tried oh, Colton, that doesn't work. Have you ever tried it? Let me ask you. Does that stuff really work? Does all the shouting and the fire and the presence of God, does that stuff work? Let me ask you, when are you going to be tired of filling up your notebook and coming to church alone? Oh, man, it got quiet in here. When are you going to be tired of more revelation in another notebook full of stuff? And you get out and you write all this stuff down, but you never actually do any of the stuff. But that is the love, right? That is the love that God's called for. Love is not sitting back. I can tell my wife all this fancy stuff, and she usually knows that I'm just bluffing. But what what actually changes, guys, what actually changes the heart of God is when we begin to do the stuff that we say that we're going to do. And this is what God says in the book of Malachi, because I'm studied up on Malachi. He says that you keep offering me good stuff on the altar. You keep offering me good, and you say, oh, Oh God, I'm really going to lay down the pornography even though we shouldn't even bring pornography to the altar. I'm really going to bring alcohol and I'm really going to bring this and that new car. I don't need it. And God says you keep pulling back your sacrifices and therefore I will put a curse on you because you keep coming against my grace. You keep, you know there's an expiration date on the mercy of God. We preach this thing like that God's some stoic God in, his, in, in all of his stuff, and he never, his emotions never change. But in the book of Hosea, he says, my mercy has an expiration date. I have pulled my mercy off you, Israel. Now we can get it back. And that's what the Lord is challenging you today. And he's saying you can get it back in your life. But what did they have to do? They needed a heart change in their life. They needed a heart. What is that? That's true repentance. True repentance isn't acting like, no, it's a heart change that actually fuels change in your life. And we are tired. I am tired of, am I the only one? Come on, I'm not being perfect up here. If I preach to you and I don't say I got some problems, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. I'm tired of bluffing at the altar and going out and living my life for myself, living a selfish Christian, living a self-centered Christianity and not be centered on God. I'm tired of getting up here. 
And bluffing, you know what bluffing is? Bluffing in the casino is when you try to look like you're pushing the chips to the middle of the table. It's when you try to look like you're going all in, yet you never actually go all in. The job is to make it look like it. So we have many people in the American church, and we are bluffing. We are acting like we're doing something that we're no, we know we're not going to do. So today, I want to challenge every one of you. We are going to have revival at this altar, and I don't want you to come up here bluffing. If you're not serious and you're not about this life, then you ought to sit back because the Lord wants to pour something out in this place, and he's not looking for more numbers. He's not looking for better people. He's not looking for somebody who has a good program. He's looking for somebody with a humble and contrite heart that he can work through, that he can speak through, that he can do the things he wants to do through because now God wants to move on the earth. How? He doesn't move just however he wave his hand and move he actually moves by consuming a vessel the same way the devil has used you the same way the devil used to use you is the same way that God wants to use you it's the same way God wants to birth something in your life but you got to realize you got to throw out your plans at the pool at Bethesda you know what was stopping I always wondered this I wondered why was the multitudes there and only one person got healed am I the only one I wonder this why are the multitudes there and only one person got healed and Jesus asked them and this is the very question that God's asking all of you today do you want to be healed do you want to be healed well I don't need I don't need I don't see you walking like Jesus you need to be healed I need to be healed pastor young need to be healed. we all need a level of healing in our life none of us are walking like Jesus and this is what the guy at the pool of says he said I've got no man to help me oh isn't that how we live? Oh, if I can just wait and I can have this anointed preacher lay hands on me and I can have this person pray for me and that person pray, praise God for those things. But you have access to the same power they have and it's called the secret place. You know that there's deliverance in Psalm 91 in the secret place? That praise God, some of you will get delivered by God working through me, but God also wants to continue it where? At your living room, at your house. True revival will not break out unless you take it back home if we live our life Sunday to Sunday and the real radical ones we show up Wednesday we'll, do, we'll live boring powerless dead dry Christianity and we'll miss everything that God has for our lives and this is what happened to Mary and Joseph they left Jesus at the temple how many of you today you can say I'm guilty of leaving Jesus at River of Destiny every service. I'm guilty of leaving Jesus at the conference. I come 10 times more ex expecting what to the conference than I do to a weekly service. And this is something I just want to preach a little bit. We come more expecting what when there's a big name, when there's a big minister, or when there's a lot of people. But when Pastor Young, when we come in Sunday to Sunday, is there any, expect is there any expectation? Are you expecting to burst something out of you? Are you coming with a hunger? Are you coming with a thirst are you coming with a desperation or are you just punching your ticket you know how you can get fired from your job treat your boss like you treat God treat your boss like you treat God what do I mean by that go tell your boss you can only work Sunday morning and maybe Wednesday night if 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 it works out in your schedule because we don't show up to that extracurricular stuff. Why? Because we all have excuses. You know that I had way more excuses not to show up today, but this is what the Lord, you can't live this life and not obey me. So when the Lord calls me to go do it, I no longer have an option whether I'm going to go do it. And I'm and all the questions I could ask God and all the things I could, and God, is my wife going to be, is a baby going to come, is this going to do? What? Who are you to question me? Wait, isn't it about trusting me? Isn't it about having faith? Isn't it about laying all your burdens, all your cares, all your worries? Yet we come riddled with anxiety and riddled with fear. And I'm just going to tell you, that's a demonic spirit. That's what he says in the Bible. He says, who put the spirit of fear on you? 
Who put the fear on you that paralyzed you from doing what God wants you to do? You know the devil is not going to try and stop you from something that God hasn't called you to do. But the very things that God's called you to do, all of a sudden there's more, there's more, there's more things. There's more blockades. There's more hindrance. And we then have to get up off of our lazy boy, get in the place of prayer, and begin to go to war. God is not looking for some people that can just read some songs off a screen. He's looking for some violent warriors who would put some war paint on who would get up in the battle where's this a good soldier is not worried about what's going on in civilian life why because he'll never please Jesus he'll never please God he'll never please the one that enlisted him in the battle who sent him off the sidelines you remember when you were broken and the Lord says you can go up on the sidelines and when you're ready very quickly I'm expect you're anointed you're called for what for everything that I did. And when you're ready to get off the sideline, I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to question you. I'm going to send you out on the front lines. But this is the way we think. Pastor Young, and we want to witness, and we want to drive out demons, and we think that we need to get permission from the people that God's placed in our life. You imagine if we were out in the supermarket, and we were waiting on Pastor Well, Pastor Young, I'm going to invite my friend over, and I'm just going to cast out the demons. Is that okay? I'm just going to I'm just going to witness to somebody on the super Pastor Young is is that okay? She doesn't have to tell you the things that the Bible already tells you to do. Come on, where are the war, where are the praise fills, filled warriors in a generation that are going to lead the remnant out to battle? See, the battle isn't won by good preaching. The battle isn't won by good teaching. The battle isn't won by big churches and good songs and good lighting. The battle is won by the praise filled warriors who go out ahead of the priests and they begin to shout unto the Lord. Come on, am I the only one? That it says, I got a shout. You ought to push. The, the breath of God is going to bl blow the religious dust off of you. And it's been we're whispering in your ears saying, I don't want to shout. Oh, you shouldn't shout. There is liberty in the new covenant. That there is a new covenant. Guys, that is way more glorious than living life, than living this religious system. And the Lord is breaking that. This will never cut it in the end days. And if you're not convinced that we're in the end times, guys, you're in your last days. Some of you, you're older. You got to realize that now there is now there is a spirit of acceleration that wants to come on you because you no longer have 50 years to do what God's done, do what God has for your life. You've got about 10, 20 years, and if you don't begin to press in, if you don't get that self control on you, if you don't beat up the flesh, if you don't be led by the Spirit, you're never going to accomplish all that. And what's going to happen? Then there's no joy in my life then there's no strength in my life then there's no fire in my life then there's no miracle signs and wonder there's no awe of God there's no fear of the Lord and if you're missing one thing guys if we're baking a cake and we miss one ingredient the cake is flat it's dead it's dry it's not good you might as well toss that thing in the garbage let me clarify on what it means to just be lukewarm Lukewarm doesn't mean that you don't know how to raise your hand and praise. Why? Because we are professional, we are professional Christians. And when everyone in the house raises their hands, we raise our hands and we all shout when pastor tells us to shout and we all do those things. But being lukewarm is when we make an altar call and we say, do you want to meet with God today? Isn't that the reason we come to church? It's not to hear a good preacher. You didn't come to hear a good word, but you came to encounter God. You came to get a new life. You came to get up on the altar, and we need to restore the altars. It's time for Jezebel to take a back seat and stop destroying what the Lord is building. But the Lord is going to build an altar of fire right here. And let me tell you the one thing that's going to stop you from crossing the chicken line to the altar today. It's going to be because you're lukewarm. Because you're going to say, you're going to sit back and say, I have everything. I have, you want more cars? If I asked you who wanted more money in the place, everyone would raise their hands, right? 
Oh, another car, another house. Praise God for those things. But that's what the Laodiceans said. They said, we got these things. We want these things. And then I say, who wants more of God? And some hands, and they're looking around. And, well, if everyone else raises their that's what the Laodicean church said. They said, we want all the other things, but we don't want more of God. We don't need more of God. We don't wake up on a day-to-day basis and say we need more of God in our life. That I need more hunger. That I need more, I need more desperation. That I need to actually get a prayer life. That I'm actually going to fast. You know that, that, that every day-to-day, you could lose your salvation in one day. Wait, where's this in the Bible? Those who endure till the end will be saved. He gave us one key to make it till the last day of our salvation. How? Endurance. Pressing in when you don't want to pray. Doing, what, doing whatever it takes. So when we get up on the altar today, we're not going to do a three-minute altar call, and we're just going to say, oh, every demon come out and push you on your way. But we need to restore it and realize that the altar call is more important than the service. The altar call is the surgery table of God. And And the reason that you're not doing what you're called to do is because there's things that God needs to remove out of the inside of you so that he can fill the space with the Holy Spirit, with revival, with hunger. You, There's only so much a person can hold, the compartments can hold. So we need to remove the thing so we can add the thing. So this is the surgery table today. And we're going to cry out to God. And we are going to begin to break out. Guys, if we don't throw it all out, we're never going to see the revival that God has. He will look over. He will step over you at the pool of Bethesda. Why? Because I'm looking on the man. I just want the oil. I want all these things. Everyone stand up. Hallelujah. Therefore, many of us are like the antelope. We know, now we know. Okay, Colin, we know. The antelope can jump 30 feet and like eight feet in the air. And what happens is at the zoo, they only need to put up a three-foot fence. Why? Because the antelope will never jump where it can't see its landing. So for us in our life, we just can't see the landing. We got this fear of the unknown. So we never leap the hurdles God has. We never leap the hurdles and the trials that the devil puts in our life. We stop and we don't leap over the wall like David. But this is what the God is saying. If you're ready to cross the line, if you're ready to leap the hurdles, if you're ready to go all in, if you're ready to surrender, if you came here for healing, if you came here to live, if you came here for to repent, if you came out to cry for your for your kids if you came to cry out for your grandkids if you came out to this place you don't even know why you're here but you feel the spirit of the lord pulling you up to the altar you ought to not let that religious devil talk you what god talk you out of what god has placed here for you if you could play some songs or whatever it is you have back there but the lord is saying if that's you i want you to get up out of your seat don't limp up to the altar but you better get up here because god is birthing something 